we want to call wolves. We want you to go to saveourwolves.org, saveourwolves.org, and comment. Leave a comment. We want to get a thousand comments tonight. One thousand. It feels very cool. And hopefully, as this number of comments from the public increase, we can actually change the policy around um, who gets to shoot wolves and why. Um, hopefully, that policy can even become grounded in science. Wow, what a concept. Um, so, saveourwolves.org. Add a comment, and then once you've done that, leave a comment in the comments on Facebook so we can shout you out. Okay, so I want to introduce somebody, and I always get your title, the garble, but it's the, the Senior West Coast Wolf Advocate at the Center for Biological Diversity. Welcome, Emma West. Yeah. 
animals are as protected as possible and we don't get close to an extinction level event after so much blood and sweat and work has been done to bring them back from the brink of extinction. Um, and also maybe the healing that could be possible of calling out that psychological underpinning of the behavior. Because the reason you get fined in Wyoming, Montana, out of a war, get prison time for shooting a dog is because it's considered cruelty to animals and they think something's wrong with your ass. That's fair. So you can shoot a I'm going to stop talking now. You nailed it. Can I take you along with me? I think we should want to
Everything's fine. I just saw like my favorite person in the world. Um, I just saw like my favorite person in the world. Um, we're celebrating Earth Day today. Don't mind me. I'm just talking to the Nova Legend. Like, we're talking about wolves because it's Earth Day and because we have a little window of time. Is it 20 days? Is it 30 days? Oh, three weeks. We have three weeks to get enough comments into the U.S. Department of Fish and Wildlife, if I'm not mistaken, um, so that they know that actually the American public would not like to see wolves slaughtered to the brink of extinction. So go to saveourwolves.org, save leave a comment, and once you do that, leave a comment here so we know you did and we can shout you out. Okay, so I'd like to bring up again Amaru Weiss. She's the senior West Coast wolf advocate for the Center for Biological Diversity. And now we're going to talk science and other stuff. Right? Right. So I think you're going to ask me, uh, oh, yeah. like, oh, yeah. why do I care about wolves? Yeah, Amaru, what's up? Why do you care about wolves? So let me set the stage for you. Set it. It's April 22nd in the Lamar Valley of Yellowstone National Park. It's 26 degrees out. There's a light snow falling. Esperanto and I, we've been on the roadside since 5.30 a.m. Our thermoses are steaming coffee at our feet. We watch through the lenses of our spotting scopes. Suddenly, over a ridge top, an elk appears covering ground as fast as it possibly can. Within seconds, a wolf pack appears in full pursuit. Two of the wolves quickly gain speed when the elk stumbles, then recovers. The entire pack fans out, ready to cut in or out if the elk cuts left or right. Three of the elk glance at each other, splinter up, disappear from view, and then reappear almost in front of the elk. Another ridge, another stumble, another recovery, and then, and then the entire drama disappears from view as the elk cuts left and the wolves follow it into the woods. Fifteen minutes before, that elk had been but one in a herd of elk. The wolves' arrival had been preceded by the sound of paws and crested snow, by the warm scent of the fur and their breath. And the entire herd of elk had smelled the predators from miles away, pricked up their ears with the sound of wolf paws sinking into snow. And then the herd had started to run. Nearly every elk had been fast enough and agile enough to keep one step ahead, one breath ahead of the wolves. Even the elk that the wolves had targeted, though the wolves had thought it was the most vulnerable, escaped. As happens, 90% of the time that wolves go hunting. The wolf and the elk have perfected each other. The forces in each have driven the other. The elk's hearing and sense of smell and its fleetness is driven by the wolf's own speed and agility. This is not just a pack of wolves chasing an elk. These are the forces of nature, the most powerful, the most dramatic. When we see an elk or a deer on an open landscape, we see the head lift up, we see the ears swivel, wariness, a sense of timidity, we see it looking, watching, ever on the alert, always looking for some danger, some wolf, some mountain lion. The elk stands on borrowed lands. The wolf possesses the entire landscape. For the wolf is the wind, the land, the trees, the scent of the elk, and the elk itself, all contained within the wolf with this easy, elegant, and mesmerizing energy. The human observer is not just watching a predator take down a prey animal. We are taken in. It is that thousand years of energy that we sense and we feel. There is no species that is more emblematic of the wild than the wolf. Top predators like the wolf are the force that balances the whole system. This is what we were talking about before. The wolf's hunting practices, its abilities, and its presence actually leads to stronger herds of elk and deer and healthier populations of stream side vegetation, 
birds, beavers, fish, and even frogs that live in those beaver dams. Wolves actually put food on the ground for other animals. Every elk, wolf, and bison that's killed by a wolf, it's visited and fed on by other species, including grizzly bears, bobcats, coyotes, eagles, ravens, magpies, and hundreds upon hundreds of species of beetles. And the diseases that could ravage deer and elk herds, wolves keep that in check by their hunting practices. Because what wolves do is they go after the animal that's most vulnerable. They pick the sick, the weak, the young, the injured, and they do that as a risk management system for themselves to best ensure that they're going to safely return home to their families because hunting is dangerous for wolves. Think about it. You have a 110 pound animal trying to take down an 800 pound elk or a 2200 pound bison. Wolves get injured. Wolves get split ribs, they get punctured lungs, they get cracked skulls, they come home empty handed. They may not come home at all. This should be like you or me going to the grocery store 10 times and nine out of 10 times coming home to beat up with no groceries. Now try explaining that to your family. And by the way, that is exactly what a wolf pack is. It's a family. It's a mother and father wolf and their litter of pups from this year, some sub-adult pups from last year and maybe the litter the year before, and then even probably some brothers and sisters of the mother and father wolf. And wolves, well they mate once a year, and generally in a pack only the lead male and lead female mate, and they woo each other in court and they mate right around Valentine's Day. And then pups are born in mid-April. Wolves love puppies. Every wolf in that pack takes part in rearing those pups. And in fact, when the adults go off hunting, they leave behind an adult wolf to babysit the pups. When the pups get to be about seven months old, they're finally big enough and strong enough and fast enough to keep up with the pack on a hunt. So then they go on the hunt and they learn hunting strategies and where are the best places to hunt. They learn this from their elders because wolves have culture. If wolves are not hunted or killed by human beings, these packs tend to evolve into these multi-generational family units, just like human families, where everybody has a particular role and a particular skill that helps the whole family thrive. These features of wolves, their, their strength and grace and power and charismatic spirit, their strong family bonds, and their essential role in wild nature. This is why people care so much about wolves. And this is why it is essential that there's protections in place so that they can return to their rightful place on the landscape. And that's only going to happen if there are laws in place to protect them and public involvement to ensure that those laws are enforced. And before I go on, right there, let's talk about public involvement, saveourwolves.org. This is your chance to be that public involvement and make sure wolf protection laws are enforced. Now why do we need to have these laws? Why do they need to be enforced? Well, the truth is, there is no wildlife species that has been more unjustly persecuted than the wolf. No wildlife species that is more in need of social justice than the wolf. When Europeans arrived on these shores 300 years ago, an estimated two million wolves ranged across all of North America. But the European invaders had their own notion of manifest destiny. And the footprint of that destiny was destruction. The settlers moved the west and inland, they slaughtered the native peoples. Then they slaughtered the elk, bison, and deer to make room for their livestock and their grain. And then they slaughtered the great, magnificent carnivores, the grizzly bears, the mountain lions, and especially the wolves. For a three-century period, wolves were relentlessly persecuted through almost unspeakably brutal means. They were shot, trapped, snared, poisoned, and their puppies were burned alive in their dens. Wolves were even captured and then set free alive with their muscles wired shut to die an unimaginably painful death of starvation and infection. And then, in the early 1900s, 
Congress began to allot money to the federal agencies to kill wolves on behalf of the livestock industry. And within just a few short decades, the job was done. By the early 1930s, the entire wolf population of the lower 48 United States was almost completely eliminated. Fast forward a few decades. In the 1960s and 1970s, America underwent some pretty profound transformations in our social, and political, and ecological consciousness. It was during that time that this country passed some of the world's most protective laws for the environment, including, in 1973, the Federal Endangered Species Act. The wolf was listed under the Act in 1974. And so listing for protection under the Act meant two things. It meant that killing wolves was now outlawed, but it also meant that the agency that's in charge of protecting and recovering our most imperiled species was now required to develop a recovery plan for wolves. But even though the wolf was listed nationally, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service did not recover wolves nationally, did not ever develop a recovery plan for wolves that was nationwide. Instead, they simply carved out three small parts of the country to focus on. The Western Great Lakes states, the Northern Rockies, and the Southwest. And today, in those three areas combined, plus the few hundred wolves that are just starting to establish in California, Oregon, and Washington, in total right now, in the lower 48, the wolf population is around 6,000 wolves. That is 1% of their former numbers, living in less than 10% of their former range. And so you see, the desire to bring the wolf back and the progress made to bring the wolf back has never been unopposed. Those same destructive forces of manifest destiny have always been there. The forces of the livestock industry, the sports hunting industry, the anti-federal government factions, and all the politicians who represent them pushed back. Their goal was to limit wolves and wolf recovery as much as possible, if not outright eradication all over again. So for the last 20 years, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has very easily been ready to accommodate those political forces that want to delist wolves. And in fact, in the last 20 years, on a few occasions, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has stripped wolves of protections in some states until my organization and others sued and got those delistings overturned. Then, in 2011, Congress stepped in to accommodate those political forces, and Congress stripped wolves of protections in the Northern Rockies. And here's what has happened in any of the states that have lost federal protections. To date, more than 5,000 wolves have been killed in hunting and trapping seasons that were instituted immediately, and I do mean immediately, by the states where wolves lost federal protections. Right now, today, wolves are being hunted, trapped, killed in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming. Even Yellowstone Park wolves, which have been studied by scientists for years, which are revered and have worldwide followings. Even those animals, if they set foot across that invisible park boundary, they're being gunned down by hunters. Montana refuses to establish a buffer zone to protect those wolves. Idaho, right now, is paying people to kill wolves in bone-crushing traps. And in Wyoming, it is legal for a snowmobiler to chase a wolf to exhaustion and then run it over. And the Trump administration would like to take these models and spread it to the rest of the country. Because right now, there is a federal proposal that was just announced in March that is the most damaging of the last 40 years. The Trump administration wants to strip federal protections from wolves across almost the entire lower 48 United States. Now last summer, our attorneys learned from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that they were going to issue this proposal. And they planned to get it out by December. So our leadership met, and we decided that we were going to go on the offense. So last November, we filed a lawsuit against the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for their failure to 
ever develop a wolf recovery plan nationwide. And in December, we filed another legal document laying out for them how they can keep wolves protected and recover more wolves in more places. And then, in January, we launched Call of the Wild, a massive, multi-year national grassroots wolf protection and recovery campaign to galvanize wolf supporters nationwide and have them join in in this epic battle. Through this campaign, which you can become part of if you go to saveourwolves.org, saveourwolves.org, we have already been training thousands of citizens across the country how to take meaningful, effective action to protect wolves at the federal and state level. More than 3,000 people have taken our training webinars, representing all 50 states, plus two offshore military bases. They've held more than 65 wolf outreach events across the country just since March. Right now, those activists this week are meeting with their congressional representatives and their governors to get them to commit to oppose federal delisting. And that's amazing. If we can get the congressional representatives and the governors to step up and say, not on our watch. This is not going to happen to our wolves. Not on our watch. We're also working in coalition with groups across the country to collect one million comment letters telling the Trump administration that we oppose this federal delisting. And there's only three more weeks left to get those comments in. So saveourwolves.org, get your comment in. Human welfare is linked, it's deeply linked to nature, to the existence of the vast diversity of wildlife, wild plants, wild animals, Diversity has intrinsic value. It's lost, impoverishes society. So we can all work together to ensure there's a future for all species, great and small, that are hovering on the brink of extinction. To ensure there's a future in which the wild is still alive. That is why I am here tonight. That is why Esperanza is here tonight. That is why you are all here tonight and you are all listening in. We hope you will join us in this campaign to protect this icon of the wild, the wolf, the animal that makes nature wild. Saveourwolves.org. Saveourwolves.org.
Como te contar Que o amor foi tanto Eu tanto queria Te ver Adeus Vou pra não He was nervous. He didn't want to improvise. 
thousand signatures today. Um, the goal is a million in total to show the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that people do not want American wolves to be persecuted and destroyed to the brink of extinction. So um, go to sevenwolves.org, leave a comment, and once you've done that, post a comment and let us know so I can thank you, call you out, let people know you're doing it, tell your friends. <laughs> the animal, the animal. This is the last song I'm going to say. Let me just thank Frank Gehry for letting us use his office space. Like, what the hell? That's so cool. And um, thank you to Fernando Lodero for the sound. And to Sarah George. Oh! And also thank you to Lady Lede. Thank you. Alec Shulman, Karen Kupala Lukacic. Mm, that's so fun. Karen Kupala Lukacic. Um, Kathleen Gray, Carlton Davis, Daniel Washington, Susan Wheeler. Thank you. Tell your friends, saveourwolves.org. Add your voice, let it be known. I'm gonna add my voice to this thing right here. This is a song I call Dancing the Animal. In other words, there's room for the animal and the civilized human to occupy the same ecosystem. Whether that's the ecosystem of your being <laughs> or the ecosystem of the United States.